Thank you. Thank you very much. And so, and it is a great pleasure uh, to, to give this, this lecture. You know, uh, I, I hope in the future there will be an opportunity to do this in person as, you know, Korea is a country I really like to visit. I've been uh, several times there and I had a great time and, and I hope to, to be able to, to visit uh, sometime in the near future. So um, I want to tell you today about this magic of, of more to mother. And this is something that, um, oh, sorry, my computer, let me just check. My computer seems to have gotten a little bit stuck. Oh, sorry. Okay, I think now it's okay. Yeah. So, but before, because this is a you know general lecture, I want to start by uh, introducing you know the concept of strongly correlated states of matter, which is something that happens in all areas of physics. So, you know, among the most fascinating states uh, states of matter that we have in the universe are those where the interaction between the constituents are very strong okay this is something that happens for example oh. in the quark gluon plasma oh. which is hello yes we, we we somehow it can you can you see my slides let me yeah uh can, can you hold on for a second uh you go to the Sorry, uh, can you hear me well? Uh, can you hold up just one second? Uh, maybe we can do like this. Or it's okay. Yeah. yeah, sorry for interruption. Yeah, you can continue. Oh, okay. So, um, as I was saying, you know, the strongly correlated states of matter is um, something that happens in all areas of physics. For example, in the core group plasma, which is a state of matter that happens just a few microseconds after the you know, Big Bang. And it's you know, where quarks and gluons you know, are very strongly interacting. And this is something that we can recreate nowadays mm -hmm. at laboratories such as Buchheven National Laboratory. We also have nuclear matter in neutron stars, okay? Those, you know, this is a picture from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. There's a neutron star here and the different phases of nuclear matter in neutron stars, you know, they're called nuclear pasta and they are all strongly interacting phases of neutrons, the different types of many body states. And perhaps something which is a bit closer to my heart are the different, you know, strongly correlated states of topological states of matter, such as the fractional quantum hole state that appears when you apply a perpendicular magnetic field to a, to a two dimensional electron gas. And in those circumstances, strong interactions between the electrons lead to exotic states such as fractionalized charge states and also new types of topological states of matter. So zooming in a little bit to the field of strongly correlated quantum materials, you know, there's our vast classes of different materials, perhaps the most investigated of which are the high temperature cuprate superconductors, where in a phase diagram of temperature versus doping, we have these, you know, a variety of phases few of which we have a very good understanding of even you know, to, this day, to this day, despite many decades of work. Now to understand a little bit the issue, you know, in, uh, strongly interacting systems are very hard to solve theoretically, okay? So for example, if you take the high temperature cuprate superconductors, okay? So uh, you have, you know, the key action takes place in this copper oxygen plane, where at a filling of one electron per copper atom, Okay, you have an insulating state due to these strong correlations between the electrons. You know, you have one electron at each of these sites, but the electrons interact very strongly, they repel each other, and as a result, these electrons are stuck in their positions. Okay, then if you dope the system with a few holes, then, or if you remove a few electrons, then an interesting thing takes place, you know, use you know, these empty sites can be now populated by electrons from nearby sites. So electrons now can move, but they have to do that in a correlated fashion, okay, because of this penalty for double occupancy. Now, the simplest model that, uh, you know, this, 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 from this correlated insulator, 
this correlated motion of electrons leads to a superconductor. And this is something that is not well understood. The simple model that people think that describes this basic physics is called the Hubbard model, where you have two you know, parameters. You have the uh, energy U, you know, it's energy penalty to doubly occupy one side, and then the hopping T, you know, between occupied and unoccupied sides. And now I say that people believe this model describes this physics of high temperature coupled superconductor because in reality, we do not know how to solve this model exactly for large numbers of particles. And as a, real, as a result, it is still a question mark whether we can go from this cover model to this you know, phase diagram of, of, of the you know, high temperature Cooper superconductors with all these complex phases. Yeah? Now, this difficulty in understanding the problem of strongly correlated quantum materials has led to novel approaches to investigate them. One of the most successful is the field of ultra cold atoms in optical lattices. You can shine lasers at each other and create this periodic potential where you can load atoms. And interestingly, in the field of ultra cold atoms, you can change the coupling strength, you know, interaction strength, you know, between the atoms in this uh, grid. And therefore, you can, for example, already about 20 years ago, they were able to change between superfluid and mode insulated physics, you know, due to attractive interactions. This was done with atoms which were had an integer spin, so bosonic atoms. So this was a realization of the bose harbor model. A few years later, people did this with Fermi, uh, fermionic atoms, so a realization of the fermi harbor model. And just to give you an idea of the latest, so this was all with attractive interactions, with repulsive interactions, people have been recently able to realize anti-ferromagnetism in the fermi harbor model, okay? Where they are able you know, to load these atoms in these grids, in this in this periodic potentials, and they can see short range anti-correlations in the spins. Okay. Therefore, they can see anti-ferromagnetism. So the ultra cold atoms field is exploring this uh, corner of the phase diagram, mod physics and anti-ferromagnetic phase. They would like to get, you know, to the entire phase diagram, and in particular to this region down here of the wave superfluidity. Okay. However, in order to do so, they need to cool down very much below the actual temperatures that they have nowadays in the labs. So down, you know, below nano Kelvin, okay? So while this is not something which is impossible to do, it's technically very challenging. And as a result, you know, there are a lot of work and, and many years of going into uh, cooling down the systems to these ultra low temperatures, but they still haven't managed to get there. So we have these two platforms that people have used traditionally to study strong interacting systems. One is actual quantum materials with typical lattice scales of a few Armstrongs. Another one is ultra cold atoms in optical lattices. Typical lens scale here is a micron. And what I want to tell you about today is about this new platform, More Quantum Matter, with a lens scale, which is called the More wavelength or the More length, which is of the order of 10 nanometers. So it's about two orders of magnitude from either of these other two platforms. Now, associated with these length scales are energy scales. So in quantum materials, often the energy scale is of the order of 100 or 1,000 Kelvin. In cold atoms, 0.1 to 1 nano Kelvin. Because this more quantum matter has an intermediate length scale, the temperature scale is also intermediate. It's about 1 to 10 Kelvin, which is a convenient temperature to explore in a solid state physics laboratory. So the, initially, the, field, you know, the development that enabled this more quantum matter platform was the fact that we can do this. Yeah? We have a new degree of freedom in condensed matter physics and material science. We can do something that we couldn't do before, the advent of 2D materials. Sometimes this is called twistronics. And this is basically the fact that we're able to change the relative twist angle between two two-dimensional crystalline structures at will, okay? We can choose to stack 2D materials with a twist angle of 20 degrees, 40 degrees, 1.1 degree, why not, as I will show you. And the electronic optical mechanical properties of these materials can change dramatically, as I will show you. Huh? Now, why would you want to investigate this more quantum matter? Okay, so these this parts will become clearer as, as I proceed with my talk, but let me give you a quick summary here. So first of all, it's a very easy way to obtain isolated flat bands to investigate the interplay between kinetic energy, interactions, and topology. Second, it's with a few simple building blocks, for example, graphene, hexanol, or nitride, or transition metal dicarcogenides. 
you can obtain a plethora of correlated and topological behaviors, okay? So this brings up the question of what are the key essential ingredients needed for complex emergent behavior of quantum matter? For example, it's clear that you don't need the entirety, entirety of a periodic table of chemistry to observe some of these correlated behaviors. Now, this is a very highly tunable in-situ platform. Okay? You can tune with electric field, electrostatic doping, strain, pressure, magnetic field, temperature, etc. And it's tunable also through the twist angle or type of Moray system. And finally, it's a novel experimental platform to explore vast new families of hybrid materials based on non-equilibrium growth or assembly. Okay? So with using this Moray quantum platform, okay, this Moray quantum matter, over the past few years, we have been able to realize all kinds of behaviors, most of the phases, in fact, of condensed matter physics, from correlated insulators to superconductors to topological phases, magnetism, nematicity, more effort electricity, strange metals, generalized rhythmic crystals, isotonic insulators, etc. The list goes on. Okay. So we are really exploring, you know, most of condensed matter physics already using this more quantum matter platform and often with new twists. Yeah. So with this introduction, let me tell you what I'm gonna, you know, what I would like to discuss in, in somewhat more detail with you today. First, I will introduce graphene and magic angle graphene. Then I will tell you about what I call the rise of more quantum matter, you know, a number of other systems that we're investigating. And then because the community has focused a lot on graphene, I also wanna talk a little bit about more magic beyond graphene. And in particular, I will discuss more effort electricity in bilayer boron nitride. And then I'll hope to have a few minutes just for an outlook. So let's start with graphene. Graphene is a honeycomb of carbon atoms. We have you know, two types of atoms, the A and B atoms, or red and green bulk here, because you need the two atom bases to tie the honeycomb. You can calculate the electronic structure of graphene in a simple quantum mechanical model. And near the Fermi energy, you have this linear energy momentum dispersion, which is very reminiscent of massless ultra relativistic particles. In fact, the Hamiltonian equation that governs the behavior of electrons in graphene is nothing else but the Dirac equation in two dimensions for massless particles, where the pseudo spin, which tells you in the Dirac equation whether you have spin up or spin down, in this case now tells you whether the wave function of the electrons is on the A or B type of atoms. Yeah? The other thing that I want you to remember is that there are two of these double Dirac cones, we call them valleys, we have the K and the K prime valleys. So electrons in graphene have this fourfold degeneracy, okay? Spin up, spin down, valley K, valley K prime. Now, if you put graphene on top of graphene and you twist the angle between the two lattices, okay? A moray wavelength, you know, a moray pattern forms where the moray wavelength, the distance between the soccer balls in the screen, is roughly inversely proportional to the twist angle, at least for small twist angles. Now that's what happens in real space. What happens in momentum space and therefore to the electronic structure? So let's take graphene. This is the electronic structure. This is the, you know, the Dirac cone. If we have a finite Fermi energy, we have the Fermi surfaces are these disks at the K and K prime points. So if we put another layer of graphene on top and it's at zero twist angle, then the electronic structures are on top of each other. If we now rotate by some twist angle theta, then the Dirac cones get separated by a momentum distance, which is proportional to the sign of theta half, okay? So twisting leads to layer Dirac cones separating in momentum space, yeah? The reciprocal spaces rotate by the same amount as the real spaces. So let's assume that we start with a small twist angle so that the separator in the momentum space is proportional to the actual to the angle. And let's see what happens to the electronic structure. So this will be the situation that would occur, okay, if the graphene electrons in one graphene layer did not know about the electrons in the other graphene layer. Okay? But when we stack, when we put graphene on top of graphene, electrons in one graphene sheet are very much aware of the other graphene sheet. In particular, they can tunnel between the two sheets. Okay, that interlayer tunneling leads to a band gap opening, okay, to gap opening at the intersection of the original graphene dispersions from layer one and layer two. This gap opening is proportional to the interlayer tunneling. This is the situation when this interlayer tunneling is much smaller than the energy of that crossing point, okay? 
However, if we now go towards smaller and smaller twist angle, and we decrease the twist angle, then this interlayer tunneling becomes of the same order as this energy of this crossing point, and therefore you reach a condition for which this lower band, which gets pushed down and pushed down in energy, reaches zero. When that thing happens, we say that a flat band condition has been realized or has been reached, and that occurs at the magic angle, which was, you know, calculated theoretically to be 1.1 degrees, okay? By Mr. Sarah McDonald, and there was also work by Suarez Morel and collaborators. The group of Ivan Dre at Rutgers also studied STM spectroscopy looking at von Hoff singularities that occur at these energies, and they saw that those von Hoff singularities go to zero energy at about 1.1 degree, okay? So there was already about a decade ago, very interesting single particle physics work about this system. Now, this, uh, you know, the things that I showed you before was a cartoon, okay, this is a cartoon. This is an actual calculation of the electronic structure versus momentum, you know, energy versus momentum for magic angle graphene at 1.1 degrees. You can see here these flat bands. They're not completely flat, but they are much flatter than the original graphene dispersion. And if you think about electrons in momentum space in a flat band, <coughs> so where would the electrons like to be in real space? Yeah? So flat band means in, in momentum space, to go to real space, you need to do a Fourier transform, okay? And that means the Fourier transform of a flat object is a highly peaked object. As a result, if you look at where the electrons like to be in magic angle twisted by layer graphene, they like to be on regions where locally the stacking is AA type, okay? Now, these regions are separated by regions where the local stacking is AB or BA due to the you know, small twist angle, there's a change in the registry of the atoms. Okay? So schematically from the top, magic angle twisted by layer graphene looks like this. You have these AA regions where the electrons like to be. They're separated by AB and BA regions where the electrons do not like to be. In a slightly more realistic schematic, magic angle graphene consists of these regions of AA stacking highlighted here in yellow, where the electrons like to be. These regions are separated by 13 nanometers. And the regions in between are these regions of AB and BA stacking, okay? This is going to form the equivalent of a triangular fermi hubbard lattice. I said triangular in quotes because, you know, these AB and BA regions are not identical. So this is in reality, this is a honeycomb structure. And I say, I put fermi hubbard in quotes because in reality, this lattice has an interesting topological structure that prevents a direct mapping to a standard fermi hubbard lattice of the usual type, okay? But you get the idea that this is something you know, which is going to be a little bit like those cold atom lattices. Okay, so how do we fabricate these devices? This is something that many people ask me. So we start with, you know, a glass light which has a polymer stack. Then we bring a substrate which has hexagonal boron nitride on top. This is an ultra flat material which is going to serve as a substrate for the magic angle graphene. We pick up this substrate with a sticky polymer. Okay, I mean, we pick up the HBN. So now we bring another substrate with graphene on top of it, with a monolayer of graphene, and we position our boron nitride such that it's more or less halfway on top of it. Then we come down and we tear half of the graphene. Okay, from the top, it looks like this. We have the glass light with the polymer, the HBN, and half of the graphene. And then we have the substrate with the other half of the graphene. Now we can, you know, because these two halves come from the same flake, they're crystallographically aligned, even though they are different heights. Now we can rotate our substrate by any angle that we want. For example, 1.1 degrees, why not? And then we can shift it on top and we can stack it. Then we can pick up that graphene, and now we have this heterostructure, two layers of graphene at that magic angle twisted, okay? And now we can continue the fabrication with, uh, you know, with a similar procedure. So our device geometry, you know, we continue doing fabrication, and our device geometry is like this. 
we have the magic angle twisted by layer of field, which is encapsulated top and bottom with hexagonal boron nitride. And we have source and drain electrodes. And then we also have a nearby metallic electrode in a field effect transistor geometry. So with this metallic electrode, we can change the density of electrons in the magic angle graphene. Now, just a reminder of the electronic properties of monolayer graphene, so regular graphene, okay? The conductivity of graphene versus density has this V shape, okay? If you have lots of, you know, holes in your system, graphene conducts very well. If you have lots of electrons in your system, graphene conducts very well. If your Fermi energy is at the charge neutrality point, you conduct poorly because you have few charge carriers. So conductivity of graphene versus charge density has this V shape around the charge neutrality point. Yeah? Now let's have a look at what happens when you have magic angle twisted by layer graphene, okay? So this is the conductance versus charge density for a real you know, device, magic angle graphene. As you can see, near charge neutrality, you still have this V shape because it remembers that it comes from graphene. But you see there is a lot of other structure here which was not present for regular graphene, okay? So in order to understand it, we have to think about this electronic structure, okay? So remember that I told you that we have a fourfold, you know, degeneracy, spin up, spin down, valley K, valley K prime. Turns out if you put, you know, four holes per molar unit cell, starting, starting from charge neutrality, okay, from zero, you remove four electrons or put four holes per more unit cell, your chemical potential goes here in the middle of this band gap, okay? You go from zero to the middle of this band gap. There, your chemical potential is in a band insulator, therefore you have zero conductance. This is what happens here, okay? Similarly, if you put four electrons per molar unit cell, your chemical potential goes here to the middle of this other band gap, and therefore you have an insulated behavior, no conductance, okay? Remember that four is because of spin and valley. Now, the interesting thing that happens is that if you put just two holes per molar unit cell, your chemical potential is in the middle, okay, of the um, balance band here, okay? In principle, magic angle graphene with the chemical potential there should be a very good metal. You're in a region of very high density of states and the system should be a very good metal. However, as you can see, the conductance of the system is zero. The system is an insulator. This insulator does not have a single particle origin, but it's a correlated insulator. Yeah? The same thing happens if we put two electrons per molar unit cell. You put your chemical potential here and you have a correlated insulator. This thing only happens, this behavior only happens if you have, okay, twist angles between the two graphene sheets, which are very close to about 1.1 degrees, okay? If you go to 1.3 degrees or 0.8 degrees, this type of behavior is not observed. Now, an interesting thing happens, okay, when you put your chemical potential a little bit away from two holes per molar unit cell or two electrons per molar unit cell. In particular, when you dope a little bit further away from two holes per molar unit cell, it turns out magic angle graphene becomes superconducting, okay? The resistance versus temperature experiences this precipitous drop to zero, okay? The data for the devices, by now we have many more devices. Moreover, because we can tune the density with our gate voltage, we can tune the superconducting, you know, the T critical temperature of a superconductor. So magic angle twisted by graphene is a, an electrically tunable superconductor, okay? Now, when my students showed me this data, the first thing that, that I, you know, this reminded me is phase diagrams such as this, okay? This is the phase diagram of the cuprates, which I've seen hundreds of times. Now, in the cuprates, they get the electron and hole doping axis opposite to what I showed here, so let me flip them for you, okay? So in the cuprates, a doping of one elect, you know, one hole per copper atom is, a mode insulator, that's what zero doping means, it means one, okay, right? one hole per copper atom. So, uh, then you have a mode insulator, a correlated insulator, which is a mode insulator. If you keep doping, you know, if you dope with extra holes, you have a superconducting dump. If you 
dope with extra electrons, you have a smaller supergalactic dome. Okay, so this is sorry, this corresponds to one electron per copper atom. This is what I meant. Yeah. Electron hole. So in magic angle twist of aliagraphene, at a doping of two holes per molar unit cell, you have a correlated insulator. If you dope with extra holes, you have a supergalactic dome. If you dope with electrons, you also get a supergalactic dome. Now, of course, there is a big difference between these two systems. In this system, you have to grow hundreds of crystals to populate this phase diagram, okay? Often from different materials classes. This, however, you can do electrically, continuously, you know, by dialing the voltage off. So that is, you know, something which is very interesting and you can do this in a single disorder realization. Now, let me tell you, you know, so, about what has happened since, okay? So we posted this, we announced this in the March meeting, APS March meeting in 2018, and we posted this uh, uh, also in the archive at the same time, okay? Then we, after this happened, you know, the what I call the theory tsunami, you know, came, Hello? okay? So yes? So I have a question, a very wonderful sure. Yeah. You discovered a uh, superconductivity in your yes. uh, bilayer graphene system. It's very similar to the well-known uh, superconductivity discovered in a cuprase uh, system. So a uh, cuprase uh, system um, has a uh, most insulating state. So in it, mm -hmm. uh, antiferromagnetism exists. Yes. So what about in your system? You declare the, your the magic doping uh, ratio show the uh, correlate insulating uh, state, but uh, you didn't uh, mention any about anything about uh, magnetism. Mm -hmm. I will mention it in a moment. Okay, so let me let, let me continue, and I will mention it in a moment. Is okay. that okay? The okay. the the the, the simple answer is that magnetism has been observed in the system too. Okay, but different than in the cuprates, okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few more words about this in a moment. Okay, so then, you know, after, you know, uh, when I was this, then what I call the theory tsunami came, which is that, you know, this is just a short list of some of the papers that appear within a few weeks of us, you know, posting our experimental work, okay? People got really very, very interested. They proposed all kinds of, you know, uh, Order parameters, superconducting order parameters with all letters of the alphabet, S, P, D, F, S plus D plus, you know, D plus ID, you name it, okay? Unfortunately, we don't know yet what the answer is to the question of what is the superconducting order parameter, okay? Though people are getting a little bit closer <laughs> as we speak. But um, yeah, so a lot of interest happened. Also, there was a quite a bit of interest from the popular press, you know, so, you know, they, they, they made all these very cool pictures about twisted graphene and all these angles. So this is something that even attracted the, the, the public, which was great. Now, more interestingly is perhaps, you know, what, what happens in terms of experimental developments since April, 2018, which is when the paper was officially published. So the first thing that happened is that we have reproduced our own results many, many times. You know, believe it or not, that doesn't always happen. So it's good when it happens. Okay, to reproduce yourself. In fact, now we're starting to measure the optimal doping critical temperature as a function of twist angle, this new parameter, you know, in context of physics. Okay. In fact, we have now many, many more data points than we have in this in this plot here. Now, even better than when you reproduce your own results is when other groups independently reproduce your results. Only then it becomes real science. Okay. So since we published our results. Many, many other groups have independently produced our results and even extended them to other systems, okay? The first group to reproduce our results was a collaboration between the group of Corey Dean at Columbia and Andrea Young at UC Santa Barbara. They uh, you know, were able to tune the superconductivity with pressure in the system, which was a very interesting extension. Uh, the second group was the group of Dimitri Efeto, back then at IC from Spain, where they were able to see additional superconducting domes. By now, robust superconductivity has been reproduced and extended by many, many groups, okay? Over a dozen groups and many more keep joining, you know, every few months. 
Now, we have also seen plenty of other phenomenology characteristic of quantum materials. For example, strange metal behavior or pneumaticity, okay? So this is strange metal phase, as you notice, this is the biggest, you know, this, the biggest wedge here in this phase diagram. It's above the superconducting dome. So basically in the cuprates, as soon as you get out the superconductivity, you have this linear in temperature uh, uh, behavior of the resistivity, okay? Which is characteristic of this strange metal phase and a strange metal behavior. Usually you expect the quadratic behavior. And these are data for magic angle graphene, okay? As soon as you get out of the superconducting state, then the resistivity resistance is linear in temperature over a very broad, over a very broad energy range, okay? I have to remind, remind you that this is a very low density system. The Fermi temperature is very small. In fact, these are set, the Fermi temperatures of the order of 20, 30 Kelvin, okay? So this extends all the way to the Fermi temperature and beyond. If you have a sample where TC is very small, then you can see actually that this linear in temperature resistivity behavior keeps going down pretty much until superconductivity sets in. So down to 0.5 Kelvin in this data. And you know, there's a, a, a group uh, uh, in, in Germany, uh, a group of Dimitri Efetov that has seen this behavior going down to 40 milli Kelvin, okay? So magic angle bilayer graphene is one of the strangest metals that we have nowadays. So we have also discovered many other correlated systems using this water platform. For example, ABC trilayer graphene aligned to HBN or magic angle twisted bilayer bilayer graphene. So now it's four layers, two with zero angle, two with zero angle, and then twisted among these pairs of layers at the magic angle, okay? With having also lots of scanning probe microscopy studies, that have provided a lot of insight into the microscopics of this system, okay? One, for example, that is very interesting, scanning talent microscopy. They were the first local probe studies to investigate magic and graphene. So in a famous uh, week back in 2019, there were uh, three papers, you know, published in Nature uh, in this, you know, the same date, you know, showing, you know, electron electron interaction with magic and graphene first STM studies, another paper in Nature Physics by the group of Stefan Lachperch, and these were by Abhay Pasupati, Ivan Dre, and Ali Jazdani. And let me flip it so that you can read this title properly. And one of the things that they found out, which was quite interesting, is that the bandwidth, the electronic bandwidth of the system is determined by many body interactions, okay? If you look at the distance between the Van Hoff singularities, so basically the bandwidth of the system, when your chemical potential is away from the flat bands, it's a very narrow bandwidth. But when your chemical potential is within the flat bands, you have a big broadening of the bandwidth, okay? Which means that it's set by interactions in the system. But that was one of the things that, that they determined, which was consistent also with our previous observations in transport to and in capacity measurements. Now I come to the question that you, you know, that was asked by, by someone in the audience about the fact that ferromagnetism, anomalous Hall effect, and quantized anomalous Hall effect has been seen in this system, which brings the role of topology front and center, okay? In fact, in this field of more quantum matter, one of the interesting things, in my opinion, is that it has meant the merging of three modern condensed matter communities. One is the field or the community of 2D van der Waals materials and heterostructures. Another one is the field of strongly correlated materials, people that did cuprates, nictites, et cetera, heavy fermions. And then another one is the topological condensed matter physics community, the people that did quantum hall, fractional quantum hall, topological insulators, ball semi metals, et cetera. All three of these come together in the field of more quantum matter. And one of my biggest satisfactions is the joy that I experience in discussing with all of my colleagues about these issues. Okay. So in fact, back in 2019, we you know, predicted to them with my theory colleagues at MIT that there would be these nearly fraction bands in more super lattices with a variety of, you know, quantized anomalous call effects that could be seen with different you know, numbers. And there was related theory work. And, you know, almost simultaneously, you know, very soon after, a group of David Gohaber Gordon at Stanford reported a very large anomalous Hall effect in magic angle twisted vinyl graphene aligned to hexagonal boron nitride. And you know, about a year later, the group of Andrea Young showed the quantized anomalous Hall effect. So the quantum Hall effect at zero magnetic field, you know, again in magic angle digital graphene aligned to HBN. 
Yeah? And also there was similar experimental work on ABC trilayography in a line to HBM. So topology again plays a fundamental role in the physics of magic angle graphene. In, the, in between, we have also looked at the next generation more quantum model, something that I call Moray Magic 3.0, okay? So uh, last year, a uh, group of, you know, Philip Kim at uh, Harvard, you know, fellow Korean colleague of all of yours, and my group, we reported back-to-back -back papers in Nature and Science about the discovery of a second Moray superconductor, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, is an ultra strongly coupled superconductor with even more interest in physics than the bilayer counterpart. Okay? In particular, it realizes this ultra strong coupling superconductivity. So, you know, let me just go quickly through this. But um, basically, in the you know when we compare superconductors, you know, usually we have this plot which is called Neumuller plot of the critical temperature versus the Fermi temperature on this x and y axis. Okay, in logarithmic scale. And most, you know, conventional superconductors, weak coupler BCN superconductors, like aluminum, are in this corner of the diagram. Yeah? As we go diagonally towards this purple band, you have more strongly and strongly coupled superconductors. Okay, superconductors with very high TC compared with the Fermi temperature. In fact, all of the unconventional superconductors are in this purple band: cuprates, nictites, organics, heavy fermions. Magic angle twisted bilayer graphene and trilayer graphene, okay, sit here. They are among the most strongly coupled superconductors that we know. In fact, pretty much the strongest couple superconductors that we know, okay? So it is not clear what makes the pairing glue in magic angle graphene so strong. How come that with such a diluted system of electrons, you can have such relatively high temperature for superconductivity? Yeah. So um, we have also measured recently not just you know Mori Magic 3.0, but Mori Magic 4.0 and 5.0. Okay. So two groups and also the group of you know Emma took recently we published you know papers back to back showing that you can have actually superconductivity also in magic angle four layer graphene and magic angle five layer graphene, okay? So now we have a family of more superconductors, a family of robust more superconductors, okay? And probably if you continue adding layers, you will also get superconductivity. Now, I have discussed a lot about graphene. Uh, let me, in, in, in 10 minutes or so, tell you about more magic beyond graphene, okay? So in this diagram of, you know, the magic of more quantum matter, there are many, many phases, but until relatively recently, there was one which was missing you know, ferroelectricity, okay? Now, ferroelectricity, okay, and, and, you know, then last year, again, three groups at the same time, we posted in the archive the discovery of stacking engineer ferroelectricity or more ferroelectricity in bilayer boron nitride, okay? So let me, what do I mean by more ferroelectricity or this stacking engineer ferroelectricity? So 2D ferroelectrics are very rare, okay? I think pretty much almost all known to the ferroelectrics are here in this slide. They usually come from bulk polar materials, which you know most often are bulk ferroelectric materials. You exfoliate into ultra thin, and then you know ferroelectricity doesn't like to you know two dimensions, but for some of these strong ferroelectrics, it still can survive in two dimensional form. Okay. For electric to the materials obtained from bulk polar materials, this is not what I mean by more ferroelectricity. I'm going to show you that you can get a ferroelectric out of a non ferroelectric material. Okay. In particular, so this is similar in the spirit to having superconductivity in twisted valley graphene out of materials, graphene, which is not superconducting itself. Okay. So, and for this, we're going to use the bilayer hexagonal boron nitride. Okay, so by layer, you know, hexagonal boron nitride or bulk hexagonal boron nitride is a central symmetric material which has A A prime stacking. Okay, it's also a honeycomb structure where the A and B sub lattices are now boron and nitrogen atoms and they alternate in the vertical direction. Okay, so that means that the natural stacking has hexagonal boron, boron nitride layer two rotated 180 degrees on top of layer one. Okay? Now, we can do the following. 
we can take a monolayer of hexagonal boron nitride. I guide, I put here guides to the eyes for the boron and nitrogen atoms, and I can break it and stack it parallel to itself, not 180 degree rotated by zero degree rotated, parallel to itself, okay? Then you would have nitrogen on top of nitrogen, boron on top of boron. This is a structure which is non-central symmetric, but it's also a very uncomfortable structure for the system, yeah? So for the system, what it wants to do, okay, it shifts laterally to find a more thermodynamically stable structure. And it can have two such shifts. It can either become AB stack, it shifts to AB stacking, where the boron sits on top of the nitrogen, or to BA stacking, where the nitrogen sits on top of the boron, okay? And it turns out these two structures have opposite electric dipole moments. So if you can switch between these two structures, you have a switchable ferroelectric, okay? So in order to investigate this, what we did is we fabricated, you know, because boron nitride is an insulator, we cannot measure transport through it. What we did is we placed this parallel stack by the boron nitride, and then we placed graphene on top of it. So we made a graphene ferroelectric field effect transistor geometry with bottom and top gates. Okay? So if there were parallel bilayer boron nitride is a ferroelectric, the conduction of the graphene sheet would depend on the polarization state of the ferroelectric, okay? And indeed, that's what we observed, okay? If you measure the resistance versus electric field for this graphene field effect, uh, ferroelectric field effect transistor, you can see that, you know, the resistance has a peak, you know, you know, the conductance has V shape as I showed earlier, so the resistance has a peak, right? So it has a peak as you sweep in one direction, and as you sweep backwards, there is a shift, you know, there is hysteresis, and this hysteresis is telling you that you have a ferroelectric material, okay? We can do this, in fact, continuously as a function of back gate and top gate. We can see that the charge neutrality resistance point has this, you know, goes, sorry, goes along this line. It switches abruptly when you go from a BA to an AB domain, okay? And then you can sweep backwards, and then you go from BA from AB to BA domain, it switches a different field because of the hysteresis. In fact, sometimes we can catch the domain wall sweeping through our contacts, and then we can see both peaks, okay? Because there is a little bit of a domain wall in between the contacts, okay? Now, this is no twisting, okay? This is parallel stack by the boron nitride. We can get more ferroelectricity, okay, if we, generate a small twist angle, okay? So instead of parallel stacking, if we have a small twist angle, now you form these AA, AB, and BA regions, <coughs> the same like in magic angle graphene, but now these BA and AB regions have opposite electric dipole moment, okay? And these domains can be increased in size one type of domain with one polarity of the electric field, and the other polarity of electric field increases the domain size for the other ones, okay? So indeed, if we fabricate devices where we have a small twist angle, such as 0.6 degrees right here, then we can see that there is this resistance state which slowly and gradually switches to the other resistive state as we increase the domain you know, sizes of one type or the other, okay? This is, as in contrast to the abrupt switching between BA and AB type of domains. Okay? Now, do we have direct evidence of this moiré, if you want anti-ferroelectric pattern, okay, in the system, okay? These are ferroelectric domains, but with anti-ferroelectric coupling, you know, between the domains. Indeed, we can perform piezoelectric force microscopy, vertical piezoelectric force microscopy in the system, so that we can detect directly the polarization, these are phase and amplitude images, and you can see the beautiful you know, honeycomb pattern, you know, corresponding to these more antiferroelectric domains, okay? So this more ferroelectricity has been seen by us and also by several other groups. Now, this is something that works even at room temperature, okay? So you can also repeat this thing, cycle this in thousands of times, you can wait for as long as you want, this thing is stable. So this is something that might one day perhaps be even useful, right? Yeah? In fact, this crystal symmetry engineering that we have done with boron nitride 
you can do it not just with boronite, but you can do it with any bipartite lattice, okay, of the type of this type. In fact, if you take the transition metal dicalcogenide, the semiconducting one, okay, you can do this parallel stacking, okay, and then you also have the structure with opposite electric dipole moments, so you have a switchable ferroelectric. And in fact, recently we have demonstrated ferroelectricity in parallel stack bilayer transition metal dicalcogenides using all the most common for transition metal dicalcogenides, the W, the tungsten diselenide, tungsten disulfide, molybdenum diselenide, molybdenum disulfide, all four of them, okay? That means that in the span of about one year, we have pretty much doubled the number of two-dimensional ferroelectric materials, okay? So which is something that, that we think can be expanded even further. Okay? Now, in the last, uh, two or three minutes, let me just tell you a little bit about some of the outlook, okay? So as you can see, we have been able to generate all these phases of more quantum matter with just really a few simple materials, okay? Using graphene, uh, transition metal decalcogenides, boron nitride. But we have hundreds and hundreds of 2D materials, okay? Some of which are themselves, just by themselves, very exotic, such as topological materials, such as WTE2 or the Hydrobachi Cooper superconductors and other superconductors, ferroelectrics, which are themselves to be, magnets and quantum magnets, okay? So imagine what we can do if we start now putting all of these together in order to generate new types of more quantum battery, new types of more quantum devices, okay? In fact, theorists are already working at this. So for example, last year, um, the, it was published the prediction of high temperature topological superconductivity in twisted double layer copper oxides, okay? The group of Leo Malens has predicted uh, a variety of more magnets, okay? Where you can have special more skirmions and special spin textures, okay? When you twist two dimensional crystalline magnets and there are many, many, many more theoretical predictions. In fact, the more magic goes beyond twist electronics, okay? People are already making twisted cold atom lattices with predictions flat bands and recent experimental also demonstrations of twisted, you know, uh, optical uh, lattices using ultra cold atoms. You can also do more and twisted phononics, okay? So with classical vibrating plates and also with materials with phonons, okay? And there are a number of these proposals and realized also experimentally. You can also do more and twisted photonics, okay? This is actually very advanced and there are now entire research programs about this, uh, twisted photonic lattices where you can slow down tremendously the speed of light and lead to all kinds of nonlinear effects and interesting, you know, um, uh, introduce photon correlations and all kinds of things. So moreover, you can also do more twisted electrochemistry and catalysis, okay? So the group of Kwabena, Vediaco at Berkeley recently realized this tunable electrochemistry with more flat bands. And my colleague, Leon Fu, together with Claudia Ferser and Yang Zhang have predicted that you know, more systems could be very interesting for catalysis, okay? So as you can see, there's really a lot, a lot, a lot to still to explore. This is just the beginning. With this, let me end by uh, perhaps the most important slide. I wanna thank my uh, very talented group, uh, students and postdocs. The part on graphene was done by Yuan Sao, Daniel Rodan de Grain, and my wonderful Korean student, Jane Park. And the part on the electricity was done by Kenji Jesuda and Shiroi Wan. Uh, I want to acknowledge also my collaborators at MIT, Harvard, Weizmann, many other institutions, our board providers, NIMS Japan. And I want to acknowledge, you know, uh, my entire group and also uh, funding. And I want to thank you all for your attention. <laughs>